once written off by the opinion polls, but re-elected by a landslide. Tsai Ing-wen's stunning reversal of fortune is largely put down to one thing. The growing fear of China, with the events in Hong Kong giving renewed urgency to her message that Taiwan's unique identity and democratic freedoms are best preserved by standing up to the powerful neighbour that claims the island as its own. Hello, President Tsai. Hi. Thank you very much. But might her strategy, as her critics claim, hurt the economy and risk provoking Beijing? If we leave aside the question of timetable, uh, the question of practicality. Are you, in principle at least, in favour of the idea of formal Taiwanese independence? The reality and what it is now is that we are already a functionally independent country. and We have our own government and we have our own election. Will there come a day when that reality needs to be spelled out by a formal declaration of independence? The idea is that we don't have a need to declare ourselves an independent state, but we are an independent country as already, and uh, we call ourselves Republic of China, Taiwan, and uh, we have our own system of running uh, the country, and we do have government, and we have the military, and, and we have elections. Your, your victory uh, is uh, largely um, uh, put down to the, 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 the central position of China in, in the campaign. Some people would say China has always been a threat in the background. Um, why was it so different this time round? Because uh, over the last three and uh, more than three years, we're seeing that China has been intensifying its threat. And uh, you, they have all sorts of actions, uh, military exercises, and they have their military vessels or aircraft uh, cru cruising around the island. And also uh, with the things happening in Hong Kong, uh, people get a real sense that this threat is real and it's getting more and more serious. You've no doubt that under the one country, two systems formula, Hong Kong's freedoms are being eroded? Yes, I think so. I mean, there was a time um, in the past that uh, the, the, the people here are very envious, were very envious of uh, the Hong Kong people that, because they have uh, this amount of freedom uh, um, under the British rule. But after 1997, uh, things uh, have changed a lot. Your predecessor, Ma Ying Zhou, uh, was able to preserve Taiwanese democracy whilst building stronger ties with China, uh, economically and culturally. Um, at a small price, the, the continued ambiguity over the status of this island, what's not to like about that approach? But the situation has changed. The ambiguity can no longer serve the purposes that it was intended to serve. So we are facing a very difficult, different situation now. And, and the type of ambiguity that uh, the previous governments wanted to use to preserve some sort of uh, space for both sides um, is no longer there. There's also been uh, talk uh, by your party about the dangers of uh, of, of Chinese influence. Uh, doesn't your landslide victory, though, suggest that those claims were overblown? Well, I don't call it a, a, slide, a landslide victory. It's a convincing one, uh, but not to the extent of landslide. Um, we learned our lesson from the last election, which is a local election. And uh, in that election, um, fake news, uh, uh, bad rumors and a lot of other things um, that are influencing the people's perception uh, here. And as a result, uh, we suffer a lot from that election. So after and you, you've no doubt that's coming from China. Mm, yes, uh, to a large extent, yes. We have amended quite a number of laws uh, to uh, 
hold people accountable if they, you know, uh, are distribu distributing this fake news or, um, or, or manufacturing this uh, um, fake news. Critics are worried that that, that in itself could be used uh, as an attack on free speech. Yes, um, and we, we do it very carefully so that we keep the right balance. So just to sum up in terms of where we are with China, something's changed in your view. You don't buy the idea that uh, reverting to the old compromise, that uh, uh, being more ambiguous about Taiwan's status could take us back to a golden era in which the political differences could be kind of shelved and the two sides could get on with just getting rich together. No, the situation is very different, but I do think that uh, both sides have to uh, think uh, more seriously about the future so that uh, we can coexist for some time and, and maintain the peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Talk to me a little bit about uh, your, your election uh, victory. Um, some people suggesting that um, it, it's not just the, the bigger questions of the immediate um, strategic challenge from China, but something is changing in Taiwan, particularly the younger generation. I think the, the younger generation, or oh, the young generation, uh, are pretty used to the idea that we're separate. Uh, uh, we, we, we have a separate identity and we are a country of our own. Uh, so, um, and if there's anything that runs counter to this idea, they would stand up and say that's not acceptable to us. How do you expect Beijing to react to, to your victory? They should have a serious thought about um, the people's uh, ex expectation as expressed by the election result. And, and um, this is a, a very strong message uh, from the people of Taiwan that is, you know, um, they don't like the idea of being threatened all the time. They don't like the idea of being undermined all the time. And we're such a proud, uh, we're such proud people, and we have success in every aspect of uh, our lives. Like we're a successful democracy. We have pretty decent economy. Yeah, uh, we deserve um, uh, respect from China. You you, you spoke uh, uh, after. Uh, the result about the, your hope that uh, there could be a return to dialogue. How do you begin? What, what can you offer Beijing that, that, that might, in your view, op open that door a little? I think um, it, it's for the Chinese to uh, sit down and, and think uh, and, and also have this preparedness uh, to face the reality. And that is the key. If they are not prepared to face the reality, whatever we offer won't uh, be uh, sat uh, satisfying to them. Can you promise the Taiwanese people that you can stem the flow of diplomatic allies shifting to, to China? I think you're, you're at 15 now. Do, do you expect it to stop there? No, um, Chinese uh, would definitely never stop uh, their effort to take our, away our diplomatic allies. But um, the thing is that we try whatever we can to keep our um, diplomatic allies. Is, isn't the danger, though, that without an expression of good faith on your side, that, uh, and this is what your critics say, that you, you, you in a way, are inviting uh, uh, China to, to, to react in the way that it is? Building trust is something uh, that is needed. Um, but I think um, I have been president of this place uh, for more than three years. I, I have been rather reasonable uh, in terms of managing uh, our relation with China. And, and we have refrained from uh, doing things that may be considered as provocative to uh, China. And, and we have been adopting this approach of uh, maintaining status quo, despite that um, there are so, many pressure, so much pressure here that we should go further. But um, in the last more than three years, we have been telling uh, China that 
uh, maintain its status quo uh, remain uh, to be our uh, policy. But, and, and I think that is a very friendly uh, gesture to China. You, you've spoken about uh, the rising threat from China. How, how serious, in your view, is the risk of war today? You, you cannot exclude the possibility of a war at any time. But the thing is, um, you, you have to get yourself prepared and, and, and to develop the ability to defend yourself. But um, in addition to this military preparedness, I mean, what is more important is that you have to get uh, international support for your cause. So we have been um, adopting this, this attitude of non-provocation because we don't want to be the party that is provoking uh, the other side uh, and make the situation uh, uh, worse or um, giving the other side the excuse to take whatever action uh, they want to take. And to a certain extent, we're rather um, mild uh, in, in our response uh, to, in our view, their provocative actions. And is, is Taiwan ready to defend itself? Do you, do you believe you uh, would be able uh, to, to stand up to uh, to, to, to a military action? Um, we have been trying very hard and, and making a lot of efforts to strengthen our capability. I do think we have a, a, a pretty decent capability here. In, invading Taiwan is, is something that is going to be very costly uh, for China. And are you confident that were that worst case scenario to arrive that the United States would come to your aid? Look, um, we have been uh, working with uh, our friends in the region uh, so that we have a, a coordinated efforts to maintain peace and stability in the region. So what we intend to do is to continue our efforts uh, with them so that uh, peace and stability can be maintained. And as uh, you take this stance and, and uh, shift away from uh, uh, China's sphere of influence and, and try to build alliances and strengthen your li uh, alliance with, with America. Some people would say, where's the real dividend? Still no sign of a free trade agreement with the United States. That seems as far off as ever. The possibility of losing some of these uh, economic ties with China as it, as it punishes you for your stance. I isn't there a risk that the result of all of this will be economic harm? Well, at, time, at a time of change, there's always uh, risk and also challenges, but um, opportunities as well. I, I think so far we have been uh, okay in the sense that we utilize uh, this situation uh, to our benefit. So um, because of these changes, uh, we are given actually a lot of opportunities. I can give you an example I mean, with this trade. Uh, conflict between uh, China and the U.S. A lot of our um, investors uh, in China are now coming back to Taiwan. Which is uh, something you're encouraging, I think. Yes, and, and we encourage them to come back. So when they come back and establishing their capability here is, is, uh, is all state of the art and also higher end manufacturing capability. And it would uh, bring this, this sort of uh, momentum for or economic growth uh, uh, for the next stage. You've broken the mold uh, in many regards. In particular, for example, your success in getting through the Marriage Equality Act, hugely symbolic. Um, do you see that as it, perhaps in the end your, your biggest legacy? No, I, I, I think I have done uh, quite a few things that people would uh, eventually realize that it's, it's good for the country. For instance, the pension reform, uh, which of course was a very painful process to go through. And uh, of course the same-sex marriage issue uh, is something um, uh, initially very divisive here, but again we went through a very uh, painful process uh, to uh, get there. And, and then we're, we're tr trying to do uh, a lot of things uh, to reform the judiciary here. Um, uh, to make the system more credible. And green energy is something um, 
uh, we have uh, placed a lot of emphasis on. And, in, and, and how should people measure your success in four years' time? Uh, what's your vision? I want to make this place more democratic. Um, um, also, uh, uh, in terms of economy, we'll be much more competitive uh, um, economic players in the world. Uh, we have been doing uh, quite a few things uh, which uh, eventually will make Taiwan the most progressive uh, country in Asia. Abolition of the death penalty? Uh, that is a difficult issue uh, to deal with. Um, the one you'd support? Well, that is uh, perhaps a, a, a goal that uh, people always want to achieve, but, the, but uh, until people have enough confidence and feel comfortable about it, um, I don't think we will be able to get enough support for that move. President Tsai, thank you very much thank you. for talking to me. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you very, very much. Thank you.